Man, man, the last few years, or the last few weeks, the last few years have been crazy, haven't they? I saw uh, Maddie Haberling had a meme, um, a guy with a, a glass, and he was toasting the first five days of 2021 before the wheels came falling off um, on it. And he was toasting to 2022. I, I saw that, and I just started busting up because that's how I felt. It felt like that's, that's the world. We just got to now look for 2022 and see what happens there. And i got to admit, this past week, I've been kind of feeling bad for myself. And then I thought, you know, what about the Christians who had to go through World War II in Europe? Imagine your church, your home, your neighborhoods getting bombed for years and years, and yet they persevered. I think of the Christians who, during the plague, um, endured the plague, serving their communities when, what, a quarter to a third of the people were dying around you. And yet the church persevered, it carried on, and they didn't give up. I think about the, the Christians who didn't get out of Jerusalem in 70 AD when Rome laid siege to it. And I'm like going, okay, Craig, your struggles aren't that bad. Quit feeling so sorry for yourself. You know, the, these situations that we face make me feel lonely at times, but yet I'm not alone. You know, the church has gone through the brokenness of this world over and over and over again, and the love of Jesus Christ keeps being shared. So the question for us today is, who shall we love and whom shall we fear? You see that on the screens there. Who shall we love? In this time, in this struggle, in the brokenness of this world, who shall we love and who shall we be afraid of? In this world we could ask the question who do we love who do we love and who do we fear the answers to those two questions about who we should love and who we should fear you find on your sermon outline and in Matthew 22 Jesus replied he answered the question who shall we love Matthew 22 he said Jesus replied love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul and with all of your mind Jesus makes it pretty clear. Who are we to love? We're to love God. And then he goes on in verse 38. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love your neighbor. Now we've got to ask the question, who's your neighbor? Your neighbor is everybody who's not you. Okay? If it's not you, you're to love them. You're to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And in this world in which we live in, where we can be connected, I have friends on Facebook all around the world. And they're my neighbors. In this 7 billion earth, or however many people live, was it 6, 7, 8, what are we up to now? Is it 7 billion, Phil says. It was 7 billion people. We're called to love them, Jesus said. Who should we love? Our neighbor. And if the Bible is not clear enough about how in who we are to love, I brought my catechism with me. And you know this is serious, if I get my catechism out. And in, in the Eighth Commandment, Martin Luther explains how we're to love. He says this, we should fear and love God. We love God first, so that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him or her, slander him or her, or hurt their reputation, but defend them, speak well of them, and explain everything in the kindest way. Love your neighbor. How are we doing as Americans at loving our neighbors? And then answer the question, who do we fear? This is a verse from Matthew 10, verse 28. And, and this verse has always kind of been a challenging verse to me. But Jesus said this, Do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Jesus says the only one you need to be afraid of is the one who's holy, who's righteous, who will sit in judgment on the last day. That's the only one you need to be afraid of. The one who can separate you from, from himself. We're to be afraid of God because he is holy and he is blameless and he is pure and, and he is righteous and 
we are not. Have a fear of God, Jesus said. He's the only one. He's the only one you need to be afraid of. Kind of makes things simple, isn't it? When the wheels come off the wagon of our society. Now, I've got to admit, I, this past week, in these past few years, have really just got me exhausted. And I told early service, I apologize if this sermon is kind of a downer. But that's how I've been kind of feeling the last few years. Like life is kind of a downer. And this last week, it just really kind of pushed me over the edge of I'm just plain tired of this place. I'm, I'm, you know, I joke around about, you know, hurry up, Jesus. I'm really praying that. Jesus, hurry it up. Because I'm tired of this world. I'm tired of a lot of things, and I've got written on your sermon outline what I'm tired of. I'm tired of racism. I'm tired of people looking at others and not seeing the heart. I'm tired of people judging people by outside appearance. I'm tired of people getting in their little cliques, because it's not just racism, it's clickism too. This is my clique, this is my clan, this is my tribe, and I only love these people. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the violence, whether it's in downtown Grand Rapids, whether it's in GR or in D.C. I am sick and tired of the violence. It's like, come on, folks. What are we doing? Why are we behaving like this? I'm tired of looking at other people with disgust. I'm tired of people who look at others with disgust. I used to be a news watcher. I used to, every night when I was a kid, we would watch the nightly news on NBC. I remember it. I would have to walk over to the TV and crank it over to Channel 5, and we'd watch the news. Yeah, Kyle's shaking his head. That's how old I am, Kyle. We actually had to do that stuff. And I remember black and white. We only had, that really dates me, man. I remember just black and white TV. You know, and I used to love watching the news. I don't watch it anymore. I don't watch it much anymore because all it is is people being disgusted with other people. And I don't need it. I don't need their disgust in my life. It, that's all I see. It's not reporting of the news. It's a commentary on the news. And it's usually marked with a whole lot of disgust for other people. I'm tired of the riots. Whether it's in Minneapolis or Chicago or D.C. or Portland... I'm just tired of people rioting. Martin Luther, in, in 1525, you might think that this rioting stuff is kind of a common thing. Martin Luther had to address riots in 1525 when the peasants revolted. And Luther said this, Rebellion is not simply vile murder, but it is like a great fire that kindles and devastates a country. It fills the land with murder and bloodshed, makes widows and orphans, and destroys everything like the greatest calamity. There is nothing more poisonous, pernicious, and devilish than a rebellious man. <laughs> Luther was pretty pointed, wasn't he? It's not a smart thing to burn your city down, he's saying in so many words. So let's not do that, okay? I'm tired of the violence. I'm tired of politicizing instead of doing something. I'm tired of people just wanting to politicize every event for their benefit, for their own good, to pat themselves on the back. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the selfishness. I'm tired of the anger. Any of you know who James Hodgkinson is? James Hodgkinson. Anyone know... Come on, you, you should remember this. This is only three years ago. Matt remembers. James, Hodg James Hodgkinson is the one in 2017 who went to a softball game. But he didn't take his glove and his bat and his ball. Any of you remember now what he took to the baseball game? He took his gun. Because he was going to shoot Republican senators because he didn't like what they said. And so he went and he shot some Republican congressmen 
And after that, we all said, we got to dial down the anger in this country. How are we doing at dialing down the anger since 2017? You know, we don't, we don't even learn from that. We don't learn from this anger that is just permeating all of culture. All of culture. And when he shoots, we say for a day or two, we got to dial down the anger. What do we do? We just crank it up a little bit more. And I don't know about you, I'm tired of it. It's disgusting, it's frustrating, it's wearisome. I'm tired of the anger. I'm tired of people trying to win points from tragedies. You know any politicians that love to win points from tragedies? They just grandstand, they pat themselves on the back. I'm tired of politicians who can't lead. They just want to pat themselves on the back and try to win some points. I'm tired of worrying about our country standing in the world. I watched, you know, the, the Senate mostly, not a little bit of the, the, Repo, uh, the House of Representatives on Wednesday. And I'm tired of us saying, what's our standing in the world? And we never ask our question, the question, what's our standing before a holy God? I think that's a lot more important question. And yet we got politicians who, who want to get up and say, oh, woe is us, look at us, the, the world is laughing at us, and they have never once asked the question, what does God have to say about our nation? Because they've excused God, they, they've sent God away, they've, they've put God in a time out, and said, God, we don't need you, so all we got to worry about is what other countries say about us. I'm tired of us worrying more about other countries and less about what, what does God have to say about who we are and how we're treating one another. I'm tired of excusing sin and violence for your people, justifying their behavior. Have you noticed? You know, I've got some um, social media friends, and over the last year, they said that's a protest. And others of my social media friends said, no, that's a riot. And then this week, some of my friends said, that, that, that's, a, that's a protest. And some of my friends said, no, that's a riot. I am tired of this inability to discern and to call sin a sin. I, I, it's disgusting. If that's a riot, that's a riot. If that's a protest, that's a protest. You can't have it both ways. Be consistent and be clear in what you're saying just tired of it. I'm tired of moral leaders who know no truth or godly standard. They have dismissed God. They have said there is no God. There is no accountability. I can do what's right in my own eyes. And now they want to stand up and say, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. I want to say to them, how do you know that this is wrong? You've thrown out the word of God. You've thrown out the truth of God. So what's right and what's wrong anymore? How you feel? That's not a very good standard. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of saying we love Jesus and showing no fruit. Showing no fruit of the Spirit. But saying I'm a follower of Jesus. You know, one of the things that was amazing about our brothers and sisters in Christ in the AME church in Charleston, remember the shooting in Charleston? They didn't say that they were followers of Jesus. They showed it, didn't they? Because they offered to that man who brought in and, and killed their fellow Bible study people. They offered forgiveness. They offered grace to that person. They didn't just say they're followers of Jesus. Our brothers and sisters in that AME church, they showed the love of Christ. And I wish there was more of that and less of this. I'm tired of exaggerations and characters that we dehumanize those we don't like so that then their words have no truth. I'm tired of the exaggerations like people who want to say that their political party is perfect. I just want to say something. If you're going to put something on social media saying, putting down another political party, make sure your next post is, is pointing out the flaws in your own political party. Because if you can't do both, you're not very discerning. Because only God is inerrant. Not your political party. 
And I'm tired of these exaggerations that everything is perfect. And we've checked our minds and lack of an ability to discern our days. I'm tired of the hatred. I'm tired of haming, blaming others. It's all their fault. And the other side says it's all their fault. I'm just tired. And I'm sorry that this is a downer of a sermon. But I just want to be honest with you. I'm tired of the brokenness of this world. And the next question is, how do you think God feels looking at this mess in our land? How do you think God feels? The God who created the heavens and the earth, as you read about, and, and, and gave light into the darkness, and at the very end of his creation says, it is very good. How do you think the God who declared it very good and now looks at this broken world, how do you think God feels? you think God weeps a little bit? That he mourns, that his heart is broken? That we have bought into Satan's lies over and over and over again? And as I look at this list, it makes me ask the question, where do I see these in my life? Where do you see these in your life? And this is what I want you to focus on for a moment. Where do you see racism and hatred and selfishness and selfishness and, and dehumanizing and trying to win brownie points out of tragedies? Where do you see that stuff in your life? Because if we can look at the culture and say, oh, look at the, look at the speck in their eye and not see the plank in our eyes, we're missing the point. So where are you racist? Where are you angry? Where are you fighting against your brothers and your sisters? See, we need to confess it. We can, this anger is because I'm starting to see this in my life. And my patience, and my goodness, and my kindness, and my gentleness is not always evident. And I look at this list, and I have to cry out, Lord, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. For I am not loving my neighbor as I love myself. Lord, have mercy on me a sinner. It's interesting what St. Paul said in Romans. In Romans chapter 12, verse 21, Paul said to us, in, in a world where the wheels are coming off, it's a dumpster fire, it's a mess, he says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with, what's the last word? Good. Overcome the evil with good. Now it's interesting, Paul does not say, just dismiss it, let it go on, who cares, ignore what goes on in culture. He says, no, address the evil, but overcome it with something that is good. Overcome it with love. Yesterday I was talking to Sharon about something I needed to say to somebody, and I, I said it, and she said, you might not want to use that tone when you say it. <laughs> because it does not communicate love. For 30 years, she's been helping me out with that, and I think I would learn, but I'm a slow learner. Sometimes I communicate, not love, what's good. I communicate frustration. So how did Jesus show us how to overcome evil with good? If Paul says we're to overcome evil with good, how did Jesus show it? Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Jesus showed it in the story of the Good Samaritan. Here's this Samaritan and this Jew. And boy, that is a bigger divide than Republicans and Democrats. And he tells the story about the Samaritan who stopped and cared for his neighbor, a Jewish man. He told us how to overcome evil with good in the Sermon on the Mount when he calls us to, to be humble and, and, and blessed are the poor in spirit. And Jesus showed us how to overcome evil with good. On those last few days, in those last few hours of Jesus' life, he's arrested, he's beaten, he's slapped, he's spit upon, he's mocked, and his back is whipped until you can see the bones underneath the flesh and the muscle. 
And he just takes all of that anger. He takes all of that evilness. He takes all of that vengeance that they have and anger towards him. And he just takes it in and he takes it in. And then when he speaks, what comes out? Father, forgive them. He speaks forgiveness to them. People that made him incredibly tired. Father, forgive them. And so Jesus takes all the brokenness of this world and he says, hey, you my sons and daughters, will you take it in? And then will you give out forgiveness and love and mercy? On their outline, there's a gap there. Who really gets you upset or who is your enemy? You might just want to write a name in. Probably someone came to mind when I asked you, who, get, who gets you really upset? Probably you thought of somebody. So you might want to write their name in or just at least think about it. Who gets you upset? Who gets you angry? And then the question after that is, have you consistently prayed for one of your enemies? And will you? Will you pray for that person you just listed? And I know some of you, some of you thought politicians. Will you pray for them? Because that's what God calls us to do. To overcome evil with goodness and grace. With a world so messed up, I don't know about you, what's going on in Lowell? That all those stupid billboards on 96 coming into Lowell from, from Lansing, it's like, what the devil is, Lowell needs prayer, man. Something's going on in that city. You, yeah, Cody knows what I'm talking about. You just see billboard after billboard. It's like, what is going on in this little town? Why is it going up in smoke like this? In this broken, messed up world that we live in. Where there's so much anger. And there's so much, so many dumpster fires. Why is Jesus so willing to redeem it? Why is Jesus so willing to redeem our broken world? You ever wonder about that? You know, if I was Jesus, I would be like, okay, enough's enough. Aren't you glad I'm not Jesus? Because <laughs> if I was Jesus, I would just say, you guys deal with it yourselves. I'm going to go somewhere else. But Jesus isn't going to do that. L look at what it says here in Luke chapter 19. In Luke 19, we see the answer of why Jesus is so willing to redeem it. Luke 19 verse 10 says this. Can you flip that to the next screen? Luke 19, there we go. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Why is Jesus willing to redeem this mess? Because that's his calling. That's his purpose. To seek and to save what is lost. And we're lost. We're lost as a culture. We're lost as a society. We're lost as individuals. I'm lost. And thanks be to Jesus that he came to seek and to save the lost. That he came to seek us in our lostness. And Jesus has the power to change. People who hated the Gentiles, you look at the early church, there were people who hated the Gentiles. Those people. And Jesus got a hold of those people who hated the Gentile and he, he did some work in their hearts. He kind of shuffled them up a little bit and they became people who used to call Gentiles their brothers and their sisters. That's what Jesus did. There were people who killed followers of Jesus and Jesus got a hold of them and he messed with them and they became followers of Jesus. There, there were people who exploited the poor and took advantage of the poor. And they sold everything they had and gave it to the poor because Jesus got a hold of them and messed with them. There were people who celebrated sin, who celebrated things that were evil in God's sight, and Jesus got a hold of them. And Jesus messed with them. 
And they became pure. They became celibate. They became righteous. They got on the wagon. And they followed after Jesus. There are people who all they did was speak lies. And Jesus got a hold of them. And he messed with them. And they laid down their lives. Because they couldn't help speaking about the truth. See, brothers and sisters, the world we live in, we might think it's a mess. Jesus says, this is my job. Can you give me a little credit? I can change people. But I'm not going to change it with anger. I'm not going to change it with hatred. I'm not going to change it with evil. I'll change it with my love. And this week, I've just been praying, Jesus, will you change me? Because the evil is starting to creep into my life a little bit too much. The frustration, the weariness, the exhaustion, Jesus, I need you to take it away. And can you give me a little more love? Can you give me a little more grace? Can you give me a little more hope? Because the world's not very hopeful. And then Jesus just says, hey, Craig, when has your hope ever been in this culture? I thought your hope is in me. It's like, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. A story is told, some of you remember the 60s and 70s, remember integration of the schools, some of us who are older. I remember hearing about it. Um, during the integration of the schools, um, a, a white mother was trying to prepare her daughter for what her first day of first grade was going to be like. And there was a lot of fear in that time in our culture. There was a lot of frustration. There was a lot of anger going on in our culture. And this little girl went to her first day of first grade school, came home, and the mother did not want to kind of communicate her fear and her frustration, so she just asked her, her daughter, how was the first day of school? How do things go? And her daughter looked up at her mom and said, Mom, there was a little black girl next to me, and she was so scared. And I was so scared. So we just held hands all day long. Can we hold hands? I know in this broken world, Jesus will hold your hand. He will not pull his hand away from you. Will you hold hands with a Savior who gives goodness, not anger? And then when you reach out that hand of love to those who might be a different race, might be a different political standing, might have a different perspective than yours. Will you hand out your hand to others? Oh Lord Jesus, help us. Oh Lord Jesus, defend us. Oh Lord Jesus, you are our hope. You are our hope. You are our comfort. Not in the comforts of this world. Oh Lord Jesus, you are our comfort. Amen. Sorry if my sermon was kind of a downer. But when we look in our hearts, as Pastor Tyler said at the beginning, if we look into ourselves, that's what we see, a downer. And on this list, there was a lot of things that maybe you see in yourself. Maybe you see some of that which you see in society manifesting itself in your life. And I just want to say to you that God's grace is for you. That his mercy will not leave you. And if you cry out, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. He will smile upon you. And he will love you. 
And so I announce the grace of God because we need God's amazing grace. I announce the grace of God unto you, all of you, and in this stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, as you let go of the anger and you let go of the violence and you let go of the politics at the cross of Calvary, I announce to you that Jesus will take it and your sin is forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.